All right, everybody. I am extremely excited to present you uh, our next panel for Meaningful Trends that is called Midlife in 2050. What a topic. <laughs> I think midlife altogether is a, is a very uh, interesting and very uh, almost like I feel like touchy, edgy topic because this is something we all live. And if you don't live yet, you will live. Um, so it's something to look forward to, I think. I think it's a very transformational time. And uh, we have amazing experts here. Everybody here have their own story and have their own, uh, almost like a methodology that they created to, to live through that transformation. We're gonna see if we can call it a crisis or not. I'm interested in crises, like that is my big theme. And when I studied uh, psychology to, you know, in my twenties, I was witnessing my parents go through the midlife crisis in you know, full-blown crisis, both of them. And I really was determined to live my <laughs> midlife differently. <laughs> this is the promise I gave to myself. And as I have five daughters, and we often talk about them, you know, three of them are adults already. So we often talk about that. Like, what do you gonna be, what's your life gonna be like in 30 years, right, in 2050? So it's a big topic. Um, and I think uh, men and women are all, are interested, living through it, it's inevitable, it's coming. And right now I'd love to start with a personal question, which is what was your biggest lesson for yourself through uh, living through your own personal midlife transformation? So Paul, can we begin with you? Please tell us about yourself a little bit and just dive deep into your own insights. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, my name is Paul. I'm a I'm a commercial airline pilot, um, and I'm a, an entrepreneur. And I so my crisis um, was at the start of the pandemic, just just kind of like a lot of people. So kind of going back a little bit, I'd I'd fought really hard to get myself a job in the commercial cockpit. It was like my boyhood dream. It was that that job that I really wanted to do. Had always wanted to do it. Um, through school, I was told I wasn't good enough academically. I was never going to be able to achieve it. Um, financially, it just wasn't a viable option for me. So I eventually pursued it, eventually found myself in the commercial cockpit and then was made redundant. Um, the airline I worked for entered administration. I managed to fight back and managed to get myself a second job in the commercial cockpit. And then at the start of the pandemic, I lost it again. Um, the crisis for me was, you know, being a pilot is, is, it's almost like an identity. So there's that age old joke, right? Of how, how do you know you're talking to a pilot? they'll tell you. <laughs> and it is so true. You know, it's, it is just rooted in your identity. It's how you talk about yourself. It's how you describe yourself. There is so much identity kind of behind that. And for me, the real crisis going into kind of the global pandemic was kind of, who am I? Who am I? What am I? What, like, I've, I've lost this thing that, that is a, a huge, huge part of me. And it's gone like it's just and it's been taken away from me you know it's not something that I've decided to give up it has been removed from me um so the biggest lesson for me I think at the start of, of the pandemic was that that titles like that don't define you and it's it sounds really obvious but sometimes you don't really realize until you're in that situation and now I'm I'm far more defined by my entrepreneurship and the, the work I do um, with my clients and the kind of transformations that that we give them that it's it's kind of less about that title although the cockpit you know my business is called the cockpit method because everything I've done in the cockpit now forms the work that I do that I carry forward so yeah that's kind of in a nutshell that's my my big lesson. I love it. I love it. I think we can all relate. Absolutely. I think that uh, losing that, and I think crisis, this is what it really is. It's when you lost your previous identity, you cannot go back and you have to think now what's going to happen now. Are you going to be building up on ruins or are you going to build up on what you've got? Like, how do you perceive all of that past in a way, right? And how do you find yourself again? That's huge, huge theme of midlife. And of course, as we're going to move into so what are we going to expect in the future um that's going to be i think is one of those interesting questions like are going to are people going to be so attached to their identities or is it or are we going to have much more fluid and easy relationship is what we are and what we or, or 
what other people perceive about us. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, Mm -hmm. I love it. Thank you, Paul. Um, Clarissa, what about yourself? Tell us, um, you know, where you are, what you do, and uh, what were your biggest insights for you, for you personally? Yes, thank you, Lyra. I'm Chris Christiansen. I'm based in Sweden now, and I am a neuroscientist by training, and I now actually work with menopause and mindfulness, coaching and supporting women in that space. For me, I think the biggest crisis, if I like, was that I'd had an incredibly powerful, successful career. And then somehow I became invisible as far as the corporate world was concerned. You know, suddenly there I was uh, seen as an extra. I didn't fit anymore. And I didn't know how to cope with that. Um, and I was also met with, you know, the normal gaslighting that occurs with the medical profession for midlife women in particular. Nobody listens to you. No one supports you. I didn't know what menopause was. And I had a crisis which resulted in almost a mental breakdown when I, you know, I had massive panic attacks and I had to come back from that and say, okay, how do I now turn my life around? How do I find a new way forward where I am calmer, more in control? And that began a journey of transformation for me where eventually I left my corporate role in pretty dramatic style. And it had been a big part of my life. I won't repeat what I said in that last meeting, but I'd never done that in the office before. And, and I began a journey of really saying, who am I? What do I want to do? And what is my legacy going forward became my big question, you know, and that has become my thriving through menopause program, my podcast. And I, I honestly didn't think when I started on that journey that it would it would be like this, but it's been a transformation for me. And I see that in the women that I work with too, how much they're seeking something different and transformative and they need some help to get there. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, it's like th that's an also very interesting question. If it's um, if we're thinking about the future, how will uh, our biology define uh, that time when the crisis or let's say that um, transformation needs to happen? Right. Because right now, I, I think for certainly for women, I think it is. Uh, uh, when Paul talked about his story, I feel like, oh, it's a lot to do with like career, right? The loss of status, loss of um, sort of the, you know, the, the work that you do. Uh, and for women, I think, like, I mean, I can imagine that the biology of aging, of uh, like kind of losing that for sort of not even rights but kind of ability to and be fertile and all of that and what associate I think it's very cultural <laughs> like I, I'm seeing the whole complex thing that that is happening for women and then we are kind of have to face that in our own lives and we cannot avoid it because it's going to happen right yeah so thank you that's going to be a very interesting question for the future how is that going to how is that going to work? <laughs> right. Uh, Dr. Amanda, please tell us about yourself and, of course, uh, share with us your own personal insights um, that were like the most, the dearest, and the most important for you. Yes, thank you for having me. My name is Dr. Amanda Hansen. I'm a clinical psychologist and transformational life coach. And I remember about four years ago, I was sitting in the hair salon, getting my hair colored as I'd been doing on automatic pilot for so many years. Mm -hmm. And there was this moment and I, I don't, I'll never know exactly what happened, but there was this moment where I remember I was on my phone and I looked up and I scanned the salon filled with women, all with the toxic hair dye on their head. And I thought, what am I doing here? I almost, my heart is beating so fast right now thinking about that moment because it was such a pivotal moment in my life of how did I get here? How did I not even question what I was doing? How was it so assumed that I would forever do this to be considered an acceptable, pleasing woman? As I know many women, particularly in the US, because I think our beauty standards here, aside from maybe Brazil and 
uh, Venezuela and a couple other places in the world are some of the hardest and highest to achieve. They're absolutely unattainable. And I started to feel an anger and like seething rise in me. And I said to my stylist when he came over, this is the last time I'll be here. And he kind of laughed and said, oh yeah, women say that all the time. You'll be back. And I said, no, I won't be back. And for me, it began the journey of watching so many women around me. So many of my girlfriends talk in corners about how many syringes of Botox they were getting, where they were doing it, women confessing they were already putting fillers in their hands and their feet in their mid forties so that their hands and feet looked plump. And everyone was starting to meld together and look like each other. And I remember saying, well, I'm not gonna color my hair anymore and I'm never getting Botox. And they all laughed and thought, okay, that's, that's gonna be really difficult to do. And then it took me on this deeper dive of like, well, why is it gonna be so hard to do? How did we get here that we fetishize women so much that they have to look like children all the time, that they're, there's no respect for a woman who is aging. It is, women can never look tired. We can never look like we've had a day of living on our face. No sunspots, no wrinkles, no show of any sign. And then I turned and looked at my husband who was so effortlessly, six years older than me, hadn't even paused for 30 seconds of his life when it came to the physicality of aging, nor did any of his friends. And I thought, how did we get here? And then I really started to understand that we got here because we as women continued, everyone wants to blame the patriarchy, but I believe we as women, every time we open our pocketbooks, we take out our money and we pay into the system, we are playing the game. We are finding our worth in these treatments, in this, you know, maintenance. And now I even have 20 year old girls telling me on TikTok, but we're doing it for, to be preventative. And I asked them back preventative of what <laughs> I've been told it will prevent my wrinkles. Like there's, we're, we're actually brainwashing young girls now to put chemicals into their faces and selling them the idea that they won't show signs of aging. Well, of course, if you're, if you're deadening all of your muscles and you're putting filler in, you won't show signs of aging, but where do we get off the train? Where, where does it end? And to, to my, my big question always is to what end? So I decided four years ago, my aging was going to be a spiritual journey. I was gonna meet myself in the mirror every single morning and I was gonna witness what was happening right before my very eyes. And I would never betray myself the experience because I believe it is so holy. And so my work then came really out of more one-on-one -on -one that I was doing with clients. And I started running big group programs for women. And now I do all over the world um, via Zoom. And what I'm really doing is revolutionizing midlife. Because when I Googled the word midlife, I barely finished it. And the Google search engine finished it for me. And it said midlife crisis. And I thought we will continue to perceive this as a crisis if no one comes along and becomes a public intellectual and changes that language. So I've decided to become the public intellectual to change the language and say, no, we're actually going to revolutionize midlife. So as the midlife muse myself, this, this kind of character that I've taken on is we can make this be whatever we want it to be. It can be so incredibly beautiful. We just get, to, we have to decide and be willing to write a different narrative. And I refuse to fall for this being a crisis. I, this is the most magical. I'm going to be 50 in a couple of months. This is the last four years have been the most alive, authentic heart opening magical of my entire life. And I want women to know what's possible. I love it. I love it. So inspiring. And of course, 100% agree. Yeah, I, I've done my journey with my gray as well. <laughs> like in the past two years with all the pandemic, it was just the perfect timing. Um, and yes, a lot of thought went into it. A lot of like uh, uh, just those realizations where you're like, what the heck was I doing my whole life? <laughs> <laughs> you know so um, yeah there's so many remarks like uh, so so uh so right I mean uh, I'm also I grew up in Europe and lived in Europe a lot before coming to US but <laughs> I remember uh kind of coming to California after being on a, living on the east coast as well and just suddenly noticing how everybody looks the same this kind of the blonde look of those aging women and I was like oh and the, the lips and everything I'm like oh yeah that's and you know it didn't occur to me until I started talking to women and then I realized oh that's what what you're supposed to now look like <laughs> so that was so scary 
<laughs> I was like a culture shock for me a little bit. Yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah. And of course, um, you know, thinking back, uh, for example, where I grew up in Estonia, and uh, even in my 30s, I had that really, not, not, yeah, 30s, I think last time I went there was like 30, something, 32. And I remember seeing my, uh, you know, what are the schoolmates, the, the, the school friends, and being shocked at how age is perceived. So just to, to let you, I, I don't know, I, I'd never seen, I, I'd never seen it on, uh, you know, let's say more Western countries, the, the, you know, that in your thirties, you already perceived as old and passed by date. It's like, this is it. It's like, you're not even <laughs> considered as a, as a sort of ro romance material. And that was kind of quite shocking because I was, I think I was living in UK at the time and I, was visiting um, my mom and old hometown and I was just like what are you at 30 you're, you're what <laughs> I'm like life just began I'm just like having the time of my life <laughs> and right now also I just turned 50 so to me it's like oh my gosh so much so much fun right and um, conversations with my like 25 year old daughter I had she just left yesterday came to visit and we I was like Sophia you know you won't believe it, but at 50, this is like probably I'm, I'm the happiest I've been. And you wouldn't pay, I don't know, whatever you would pay me to go back, I would be like really hesitant. <laughs> it's like going through that again, though. Right. So I, I totally, I hear you, Amanda. It's like, yeah, revolution needs to happen. So let's, let's pose this new question. So in the future, uh, one, some research I did for myself personally, as I was going through my own uh, time and really loving the whole midlife theme. And I asked myself, uh, sort of, so what am I, what's going on kind of in the whole field of, you know, medical field, uh, transformational field, uh, career field, right? This is something that Paul is doing, right? Is kind of helping people to transition and start their own businesses, uh, uh, right? So it's like, a, it's a big thing. And one of the things I found out is that uh, millennials going to live until 100 years old. This is like expect life expectancy, right? Isn't it interesting? And so because of that, they understanding of midlife going to be very different. They're not going to have midlife. They're going to have several sort of transformational points in their life and they're going to be to do with careers relationships and you would expect many of them throughout life unlike us who maybe not anymore but you know like a decade ago probably having second relationship was a kind of already frowned upon right like what are you doing divorce what, what is it right now like i mean all my generation people have at least a couple of marriages there right i'm not saying everybody but it's just uh, very common right and we're still dealing with this kind of like a sort of stigma of that and what it means and maybe did i fail because of that right um <clears throat> and i think for millennials that's going to be very different because of just because they're living until 100 years old so they're probably going to have several different relationships, long-term or whatever relationships, and they will be defined maybe by, you know, sometimes maybe it's for romance, for having kids, for doing this, for doing that. And that's kind of what my research showed. And I was very, you know, interested in that type of living career-wise as well. Mm -hmm. um, so like, Paul, when you described your devastation with losing the part of your identity, I'm imagining that in the future, that's not going to be so dramatic it's going to be something to expect that of course you know i worked there i gave you know decade or, or whatever years of my life to this profession and now i'm happily transitioning and i'm maybe taking having another education investing again in, into my own uh, you know new status or new career new passions so let's explore that a little bit so let's begin with kind of what do you see the biggest things in the future <clears throat> uh, that are to do with midlife and uh, what can we expect um, and 
I invite you to just fantasize and just give me the most, <laughs> the, the, you know, I think some things are based on research and some things are just hypothetical, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Paul, do you want to do, do you? Yeah. So I think it's a really, I think it's a really fascinating subject. And for me, I think where, where I can see things going now, and I can see this with myself and I can see this with a lot of kind of my former colleagues that people are no longer kind of willing to settle. Like people are not willing to settle for second best. So mm -hmm. I've me taking me, for example. So in the last month I've been headhunted for seven flying jobs. <laughs> um, you know, there's a, a huge crisis in the, in the aviation industry and they are desperately looking for pilots to come back to the cockpit. And I've turned them all down because for me, it's not even just the, the thing of that defining me anymore, but when I, well, you know, I, I've had 10 years in, in, in flying and, and it was my dream and I would have done absolutely anything to get myself in that position. And then you almost see the other side of it. So I saw lockdown, you know, I've got two young children. I was here for my children during lockdown. I got to do the home educating. I got to spend time with my wife. We just had, we had the most amazing lockdown really in, you know, in the grand scheme of things. And to now think, do I want to go back to being away from home all the time? Do I want to go back to having to fly on a weekend, having to fly during school holidays, to, to not see my children growing up? And I think that's, I think a lot of people are kind of hitting that point now of actually there's a lot more to life than my career or, you know, anything, anything, basically there's so much more to life than any one singular thing. And I think that's where the world is going. And I think a lot of the time it, it tends to happen around midlife, doesn't it? Where you kind of hit that point where you think, is this it? Is this am I going to keep doing this now for, you know, someone said to me the other day, you know, they've, someone's just gone into their, uh, into their fifties. Um, and she said, oh, you know, I can't wait to retire. And we were talking about, you know, you might have another 17 years of working still to go. Um, now I'm in my, I'm in my late thirties. So I've only been working for just over 17 years. And I think, my God, that is, that is still a really long time to go. And if you don't enjoy what you're doing and you don't want to be there and you're not satisfied, um, I kind of, you know, what, what's the point? And I kind of think that's lockdowns brought that out of a lot of people. And I think Clarissa hit the nail on the head with that kind of what's my legacy piece? Like, what am I leaving? What am I leaving behind when this is all done? Who am I? What am I? What have I left? There's, there's, there's so much more to, to life than those small things that we think define us. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that for you, the kind of life put you in that position where you had to think about this, right? And then uh, lockdown, right? It's like everything kind of, it's like pieces of the puzzles, you know, came together for you to realize, oh, wait a sec, like this is actually, I, I have to ask myself what I want to do now, right? I think a lot of people don't get to even think that or, or ask themselves that question until so much later until they're so drained, so burnt out, that to think about this next, uh, you know, the, the, the legacy, to think about uh, the purpose and what do I really personally want to do is like, uh, like I'm exhausted right now. I just need to, I just need to, you know, like recharge somehow. Like this is what I'm seeing a lot, right? With, with people who are, had a long, uh, especially successful career because it's so hard to leave. It's so hard to just turn around and say, ah, oh, okay, you know what? I, I, I'm i gonna put myself first and I will actually contemplate my desires, my passions and my purpose, right? It's kind of life just gave you that gift of like, okay, <laughs> think about this, right? That's your choice. And I yeah. think um, in the future, I think people. I think people are going to be aware, so much more aware of that. They will be. I'm looking right now. So many of my friends, are, you know, from California, who are going through this resignation. What is it? Uh, resignation something. I forgot what it's called. Resignation phenomena where people uh, they just uh, resign from jobs they just don't feel like doing. Which is what? What? 10 years ago, who would ask themselves, I don't feel this is the right corporate culture for me. I don't feel 
they love me enough or appreciate me enough at my job. What? Right now, it's real. People actually make, a, they vote, they choose, and they say, no, I'm just going to leave that big salary. And like, I mean, so many of my friends have done it. And, and um, I myself, I've been a free spirit my whole life. So uh, to me, I'm, I definitely just like Paul said, I have another side of, you know, working for yourself and, and being an artist and doing this <laughs> whole life this way. So I'm thinking, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> but... I think, I think it's fascinating you say that actually, and it just, a statistic came to my mind then. So I recently set up a, a new business kind of trying to tackle some of the recruitment problems um, to kind yeah, of humanize yeah. the recruitment process. But one of the things that's, that we've I, we found in the UK, so the younger generations are more likely to go straight into work now than they ever were before. They're not seeking careers, they're just seeking work, but it's the over 50s. The over 50s are the ones that are leaving. They're kind of coming back after COVID and going, do I really wanna do this? And as a result of that now, there, there is, and there's, there's gonna be further into the future, a real skills gap because we've got these people that are really highly skilled that are leaving work because you know exactly like you said why why would you continue if if you're not enjoying it um I think that's fascinating that the the younger generation are kind of happy to just take a job and kind of deal with it and see where they're going but it's the older generations that are like actually no (laughs) this isn't for me let's let's do the right thing now you know what that what I wonder which I think you almost contradicted that story at least I had in my head uh, almost until now it's kind of revelation for me is that well older generation almost can afford to do that I'm thinking a lot of people like people even I talk with who are in the 30s and probably starting a family this is kind of where you often rely on that job you you just you know you just kind of sell yourself out in a way just because you must right because you you are so um uh, you know unsure whether you can survive as an entrepreneur for example which as we know is a hard work right it's it's like you actually do more work <laughs> right well at least uh, you know but hope you you love it right that's the difference so you're happy <laughs> that's the difference i think it's everything but um but I can almost see like a, one of the panels we did was about what comes after success, after you've achieved everything, because not it's not just material success. It's just uh, also uh, I got my status. I got my validation. I got my awards, rewards. Uh, I've got th- this pat on the back. And now I can think about my legacy. And now I, I'm free to 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 express myself and fly and do whatever. Right. So it's almost that was one of the stories at least I was telling myself as sure you know in my own life experience that as well um and Paul would have because you and your 30s and you were kind of put in that position and there you are choosing yourself over other options right so that is remarkable and I think that's going to happen more and more in the future yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. As a mother of a a young man who's 25, he's not following the trajectory that we normally walk. You know, we we went to university, we got a job, we bought a mortgage, we had a partner, we had, and we kind of followed a path that looked very similar to our parents. And I hear him and his friends say, well, so what? I mean, he turned down a job at Google and he said, well, you know, it's too much hassle to move to London. What do I want to do that for? He said, it's not worth it. And, and it was a really good job. And he said, no, I'm quite happy because I want to work at home. I don't want to be forced to have to come into an office. And then he said to me, I think I'm going to take a year off now and go traveling. And, you know, we would never at 25 having kicked off and he's doing really well. He's published loads of academic papers and all sorts of things. Because now, I don't think I'll do that now. I think I'll just have a year off now and go and live in Turkey. And and the whole trajectory, and of course, with him being LGBTQ, he isn't going to marry. He doesn't see children on the agenda. His, his whole kind of projection into the future is completely different. And I think we're seeing that with this younger generation that partly they're frozen out of things like the housing market, et cetera, in so many places. I mean, Sydney, New York, London, it's, it's not even a possibility for them. So they've kind of parked that and they are now looking to live more fluidly than we ever did. 
Uh, and therefore, I think, they, as you said at the beginning, Lyra, they'll have a career and then they'll have a different career. They might go back and retrain. They'll have a year out and just a very different kind of uh, approach to living. And I think they don't mind if they just take a job for a year and work in a bar that they, they don't really care about that in the same way. And the only time it starts to be maybe different is if you have children. But I've even got younger friends who you know, gave up corporate jobs, started health coaching. They've got two small children. They went to Chile for a year. Now they're back in Sydney. Yeah, I would never have done that, but that's exactly what they're, they're doing. And I think it's refreshing and interesting in, in, in the way that they're living their lives. And I think it's a much fuller way of living the way in the world than we have done. We've been so stifled by convention. I think mm. they have a little less fear than we did. I feel like my generation was more fear-based in regards to you get the job. You don't even think about saying no. And it's not about, do I really enjoy this? Is this meeting all of my needs? Am I feeling super fulfilled? It's like, no, I'm getting a paycheck and I'm thankful for that. Where I see, you know, I have a 23-year-old son, a 21-year-old son, uh, and, they, and then some other kids as well who haven't graduated college yet. But the two, the older two, same thing. They're like, hmm. I think I'm going to take six months and backpack around Europe and then see what I want to do after that. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, that's so brave of you. That feels brave to me. I would not have been, you know, and I also think back like at that time to have been able to experience that when I wouldn't have given to have been 21, 23 backpacking around Europe. Oh my gosh. So beautiful. I, and I, I see it as like, that feels really adventurous and and brave from the lens where I'm standing uh, comparing myself at that age feeling the pressure like I have to get the job I have to secure my life yeah I love that so I, I've written down those like key words here that pressure yes mm -hmm. I'm, I'm feeling that I was actually one of those people who did um very um took a very unconventional path and had traveled the world and did the whole sort of thing that I feel like oh my gosh my kids are strangely conservative about all things. And I'm, I'm thinking that's because they were brought up with this traveling and blah, 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 do whatever you want. And, and so they are like, I'm looking at them and I'm sometimes thinking, how did you, like, how did you get to be this? But as they're getting older and getting over the kind of teenage rebellious <laughs> behavior, they are, uh, I see they're becoming more liberal and more kind of, uh, imaginative with what they're doing and more creative but it's funny that um i can see kind of in the next generation also but very different yeah definitely um pressure this is something that i can see that our new generation are just not willing to take on as what we did very we didn't even think that that is first of all i think wrong right because we never questioned that pressure and i wrote down like three things here that I see, especially maybe in US, I'm not sure whether in uh, Europe it's happening or not, but in US I see, um, and I was chatting with my daughter about it as well, is kind of overspending, kind of living above your means, you know, that the mortgage, we're talking mortgage, right? We're talking about getting into debt and that is completely encouraged by the system, encouraged by the whole uh, sort of, and there's a whole ideology behind material success and what you have to have and what you what's expected expectations all together how we're supposed to bring up our kids how we're supposed to look like everything that this is like what pressure really looks like and this is what we're paying for by accept accepting the jobs we, we don't like because all of this costs something so so okay i'm not going into all the behind the scenes of that but those are the, the kind of three things that i identified here as mortgage expectations and ideology are, are kind of things that are i think going to change well i hope and this is my next question is like what how should we prepare so i personally think that those material focus on on this kind of life and this is what i have to pay for and this is how i have to put myself into debt 
and, and just slave for for this lifestyle that is very questionable and our younger generation is just like we're not why who told you who told that i have to get settled and and do this life expectations again expectations of beauty i think there's so much pressure right now on young people to 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 look a certain way i think it's gotten so much worse than what even we had um so I don't know with, with, of course, with those beauty standards, what's gonna happen? So this is an interesting theme. We can, you can address that, talk about that. What should we do about that? And the ideology, like how um, gullible are our next generation going to be? Are they still gonna be gullible as we were? Are they still going to have to get to the, you know, 40s 50s to question this or do they have to get something happen to you to question this uh, you know like what am i really believing in and what am i really prioritizing what the values are so let's explore that um what would be your a kind of a plan of action or advice for uh, uh, you know people who are uh, creating those systems i know all of us are actually in the trenches and we're doing it and we are changing the systems and we're changing paradigms and ideology but tell us your thoughts on how should we prepare for the better future so amanda do you want to start yeah, yeah i'm willing to share something that's going to be really hard to hear and probably quite controversial but I, I make no apology for it because I think it has to be said. I think the thing that is happening with women is everyone's tiptoeing around what needs to be spoken of. And um, we are somehow strangely disguising getting Botox and altering the way you look and staying young forever as feminism. I have women say to me all the time, but this is feminism. Women can do whatever they want, whenever they want. And I, I, my thought back and often what I say back isn't feminine. I mean, feminism, I think with the lens of every woman, you know, choice for herself to do it as she pleases. Absolutely. But I think they've distorted what it means to be a feminist, because if it, to me, feminism is like, here I am. I claim my aging. I claim every decade, every stage, every phase with pride, with zero hesitation, hiding or apology. To me, that feels more like a strong stance for feminism. To me, it feels like you're pretending to be feminist disguised under this illusion of falling for this, these beauty standards and doing all the things that are probably poisoning you and then turning around and saying, but it's feminism. Don't, don't say that. I am, I am a stand for all women and all choices. And of course, everyone will do what they please. But I refuse to, to swallow the message. I refuse to not speak what needs to be spoken because 20-year-old girls are walking around convinced by their mothers this is feminism. And now mothers are taking daughters to their appointments to get their, their lips at 18 and all of their injections. And their, this is their birthday present now. Um, and so, and I know this because a very dear friend of mine is very involved in that world. And she said, they have to turn 14 year olds away and say to the parents, bring her back on her 16th birthday. 14 is a little young. So we are in a real crisis as far as I can see, um, because it's a multi-billion dollar system. It's not stopping anytime soon. Um, I was running a quick errand earlier this morning and I'm in South Florida. And as I came around the corner, five women were walking towards me. And what I saw really saddened me, really saddened me because I feel like I'm walking around in an avatar movie or some kind of cloning situation. And it, it feels really sad to me that this is what women believe is how they'll find their worth. You know, I was in Paris, I mean, I, I, was in, um, I was in France a couple of weeks ago in Portugal. I'm going back to Paris in a couple of, tomorrow actually. And one of the things I love about being in Europe and I've been in Europe a gazillion times over is it doesn't have that feeling to me. I feel like everyone's like, there's a flirtatious energy, no matter what your age, no matter what your status, everyone's like living and looking. I, I just don't even feel like people are on their phones as much. I feel like there's more celebration of humanity and life. And I see women with wrinkles and gray hair, and I'm just like so free and so happy being around the reality of it all. And I think in the, you know, I can only speak for the U.S. because it's where I spend most of my time. I feel like we are on a really tragic 
we're, we're like getting sucked into this really tragic vortex. And if we don't start, and I'm willing to have the conversation, I'm willing to be the one who starts saying, calling this out, like, what are we actually doing? And, and the last thing I'll say is when I ask women, what are we actually doing? It's fascinating how there's two camps. There are camps of like, you know, I've been wondering that too. And then there's a very different camp that says, stop shaming women. Stop making women feel bad about themselves. You're, you're, are you bullying? Why are you saying that? And this is feminism, right? So it's like, there are some women, because I think the conversation, the alternate conversation is so new to them that it's, they don't even want to hear it. It's like, don't say that. Don't say that. I might have to actually for one second acknowledge that I'm putting poison into my face every three months, probably for the rest of my life and think and trying to think that it's not that big of a deal. So um, I'll just keep having the conversations. I mean, obviously, I don't think my going viral, um, especially on TikTok, has been an accident. I don't think all of the, you know, and it's funny because even it's like people can't fully hear this. I've even had a lot of huge beauty brands reach out to ask me to, to do work with them. And I'm like, sure, show me your um, show me your ingredients list. I'll let you know, because I never intend to anyways. They show me their ingredients list. I'm like, yeah, I can't pronounce anything in your product. So absolutely, it's a no. Because <laughs> I want to lead them down this path of understanding how insulting that you would ask someone who's advocating for all natural to, to like now put like these products in my hair or on my face and say, that's why I, you know, what I support. It's like, no. So I'm just willing to walk that edge and have those really hard conversations, stir the pot everywhere I go, because somebody has to, you know, I, I'm doing it to leave the legacy, but I have a 19 year old daughter who looks at me and says, I am so thankful that I have you as a role model because it's so much easier. I would never want to be in a situation of so many of my friends who are watching their moms do all these things and struggle and not have an alternative message. So I'm doing it for my 19 year old at the end of the day. Um, it's for me, it's for her, it's for all the women who want a different storyline. But I, do, I think that if we don't, if more of us women who are older don't start having these conversations and stop tiptoeing around, we're not doing any service to the next generation. I love it, I love it. I almost see like one of the interesting solutions is almost to, um, you know, for you guys in Europe, almost like teachers and show the insights into how, how did you manage to, to keep yourself kind of out of that whole trend that is for sure in, in you, I'm, I'm thinking about Florida actually <laughs> now comes <laughs> back to me a couple of times I visited Miami, especially it's also a cultural shock actually even comparing to California or let's say Boston where I lived uh, that doesn't have so much of that. Um, and of course, some of the California has very similar vibe. So it's like, it's kind of, there's uh, places where that is really, really visible. But if we're thinking about who really does the TikTok, who really does the Instagram, right? <laughs> so the, those, are, those are the people we see. And this is what our youngsters see, because the, the rest of the women are not showing up and they're not thinking that they're gonna be playing the game of, of you know, public figures and, and um, celebrities, which is kind of shame, right? Because we need more role models that are just, just sane and normal, and, you know, and, uh, you know, um, independent, who can think independently from all that stuff that is, you know, those expectations that are just always are there. Like, I mean, and I think that's why the response yeah. is in everywhere. Hollywood, like the, the movies we watch, like there is a, you know, you can't escape what you see. And of course, if you're watching, for example, uh, European movies, which are, again, th that is almost a solution. Why can't we see more of that on Netflix, for example? Why don't they show us more of um, foreign cinema, which just doesn't have the same message? So I, I, I'm looking to Europe for that, right? It's like to just like, yeah, maybe it is an answer there. I, I absolutely love Europe, Italy. Those are my favorite old ladies in, in Italy with this. <laughs> I'm, Italians, always... I'm representing in the US for the Italian women. Oh yeah, oh, perfect, exactly, you see? So great, great. So well, jump I think in. there has been a shift though, Lara, towards a more American model, unfortunately. Yeah. And I've definitely seen that 
you know, coming back to Sweden after so like 30, 40 years away, how much that American culture and the Botox and the hair dyeing and the body shaming had come and that the women of my youth, like my aunt and people like that, who, you know, didn't really wear makeup and very sort of sporty outgoing women have become less prominent. They're still there, but they are certainly not as much the, the role model as the women I meet out networking and particularly medlife women. So it's a very pervasive uh, kind of culture that, that seeps in because of so much American television and influence and Hollywood and all the social media is driven by the US. Uh, and I certainly would say in Australia, Sydney was just like Florida and Canada in, in miniature. Mm -hmm. So what would be your, um, what would be your almost like a, a solution or advice or something that you see we need to, uh, to bring in as a message, of, not just about the looks, because, you know, on a broader level, midlife altogether, men are going through midlife uh, in such a dramatic way as well. You, you can't deny that it's happening. I'm looking at my husband, I'm, I'm, I've had stories in my life where men could not even survive the crisis that they've been in, where they really feel like this life is over because of the um, reaching certain age or losing a status. It's very interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a broader conversation. Um, Clarissa, what, what do you think as a so, uh, kind of advice solution for the, for, I think for us, as we are bringing up our kids, I mean, I feel like we are so responsible, right? We all have kids here. So it's like, we are the ones who are actually doing something about this. Well, I think, first of all, we've got to be having more debates like this. We have to start to open up conversation and normalize what midlife women look like. And there, there is actually a fantastic campaign running in the UK, which Paul may be aware of. It's called Behind the Woman. And there's a massive campaign. I think there's something like 50,000 women have stood up around the UK and shown what they really look like in swimming costumes, in groups. And they're just pushing back and saying, this is, you know, 40, 50, 60, this is us. And I think the the responsible media has a big role to play in that. And I mean, we've looked at The Guardian, have an article every two or three weeks about people who've reinvented their lives at 60. And so building up role models, showing what we look like, highlighting those and, and getting out there is, is what we have to do because we're not going to do this ourselves. I mean, me showing up on, on Instagram is nice, but you know, that's kind of, only a very small part and so we have to have a bigger mass drive and push back on impossible beauty standards and in my area you know I absolutely there is a furore going on about chemical versus natural menopause that is just I mean it's blown up in the media with even doctors pushing back against the pharmaceutical route. And, and, and now apparently the British Medical Society have actually locked down the article. So people can't read it anymore because there was so much controversy. They actually locked people out of reading it now because it just went so out of hand, which I think is a great pity. But obviously we are opening up debate that is very uncomfortable um, because it's highlighting profiteering on women's health. That is, mm -hmm. that is shocking, but which also needs to come out. So I think this opening of the Pandora's box is really what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see that. I see that. One of the panels we had was about, you know, I told you like uh, what's beyond success, but one of the, why it started, because it was actually one of the producers of the Teletubbies, whom I, uh, my kids grew up with. And, um, <clears throat> and he was talking about this interesting hypothetical idea that well if in the future there were no disabilities no sicknesses and people just lived you know forever or they were you know they figured out the aging and if we had that sort of utopia <laughs> slash dystopia <laughs> situation where it's like okay we don't age like doesn't mean anything right 
and or uh, and uh, and success is or success, let's say material success or wealth is not something desirable because everybody has it in the world like uh, and i was kind of thinking maybe it's going to take longer than 30 mm -hmm. years but of course we can almost imagine that why wouldn't we achieve that as a humanity right uh to to really be that amazing uh sort of you know place where everybody's got plenty and we don't have to be concerned with survival or with battling sicknesses and our purpose of life is not going to be about you know helping the needy and all of that stuff that really stems out of that that right now i think when we're thinking of purpose of life we want to change life for better we want to change humanity for better and now suddenly that's not the question and then the question is uh, so what will we do then? And so that was a debate and I can li link that. Um, I think it was a great debate where we talked about creativity and nurture that is like as two qualities that always going to live forever. Like we will always do that. Um, but I, I'm looking to Paul right now to, to kind of open us a little bit and give your insights into what do you think? Um, how should we prepare, you know, for the future? there's a huge gap between what we're talking about this prosperous healthy life for everyone and what we live right now uh living your passion completely living out your your desires and passions and talents comparing to what we have right now still people need to think about how they're going to pay their bills and and just survive like like right now i don't think you can just drop everything i mean in some countries maybe you can but would that be even a desirable thing? Like, would people potentially completely not want to do any job at all? Like, I, I don't, I, I personally don't think that. I think we have innate desire to to do something, create something, and we are. But will ambition be a, a, a you know force that drives us? I don't know. So um, I'm looking to you, Paul. Tell us what you think. Yeah, I think, do you know, I think the thing that ties this all together for, for me is is around questioning and it's around kind of giving giving people permission to ask questions, giving people permission to challenge, giving people ownership of their own life. You know, we, we talked really early on about the fact that we've just done a lot of things because that's what our parents did and that's what our grandparents did. And, you know, I remember I had a conversation with my wife recently and we were talking about money to do with the business. And um, and Amy, my wife, said, "Oh no, no, we don't. We don't talk about money." And it was it was a really interesting thing of like, okay, why don't we talk about money? Like, where's this come from? And you kind of dig deep, and it's like, you know, my my grandfather was like, "We never talk about money. We don't share anything to do with money. You know, it's swept under the table. We don't do it." My my kind of experience in the commercial cockpit, and this is one of the things I I take with me into businesses, is that you question everything. Like you absolutely question every single thing. And, and it's come from a lot of kind of big accidents in the aviation industry where um, co-pilots or first officers um, haven't challenged a captain. Like they haven't been willing to challenge authority. And as a result, they've seen a mistake happening and they're not willing to do it. Um, when I very first started off my business, actually, I did some, some research into the um, medical industry in America, actually. It was a, a, a whole can of worms that I kind of wish I hadn't gone into. But I, I, I looked at one particular hospital in New York and the, the research that I, I found was over the course of a year, there were 100 junior doctors who had seen medical negligence and didn't feel like they could speak up against it. Mm. And for me, that was just huge. Like, why don't we feel like we can talk? Why don't we feel like we can challenge these things why can't we you know there's so many things going wrong in the world right now and you kind of feel like if somebody just asked the question if somebody just started the conversation I mean we can we can go deep into this <laughs> you know Ukraine the fuel crisis the, so many so many problems in the world right now that potentially could have been solved with just the start of a conversation just one person being willing to stand up and actually say why why are we doing this? Why am I in this situation? And I, I think the younger generations are much, much better at that. I mean, I think why is my son's favourite word? Um, <clears throat> he's constant, you know, why? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Um, but I think that's, you know, if, if I would have said that as a kid, the answer would have been because I said so. 
And actually, for me now, with my son, I'm much more likely to give him an actual answer, you know, to actually sit down and have the conversation. And it can be something really silly, like, you know, what we're we having to eat. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but just a allowing that space, allowing that space where those conversations can happen, I think that's going to be the thing for me that's that's going to change the future for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> what what I see is like that kind of independent thinking. I absolutely love that. I, I encourage always anybody to be whenever that we had this independence day, I said, like, have your independence day for you. Like some some claim, some sovereignty here. Yeah, like, please, like it, it's important. <clears throat> but I'm thinking how our educational system has to change because right now if you I don't know if you said you, you have a four-year-old or you have like a sort of younger kids right so it's like you almost didn't enter that whole educational system where that's gonna be like I'm looking at my 12 13 year olds it's it's a, it's I'm it, it's tragic yeah. like going through school system and it's just like wow they are so much more conservative and brainwashed than we were even and I'm just like oh my god is there hope like we, we're doing everything possible to to uh, to like literally question them and, and bring them that conversation at home where you know you don't you, you can really think about what your teachers are telling you this is not like that it's not often you, you have to question authority this is like <laughs> this is your right this is what you need to and, and but we're doing it at home but it is like almost i feel how can we change the system educational system i think for, um for sure and then or you meant you know we mentioned of course like i mean this is also a big theme of uh, corporates uh, you know and and profiteering and uh, the whole message that they kind of caters to that, to the business. And it's like, okay, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work we have to do on the kind of, I think on a very systematic way, on a, on a very um, bigger scale. And I am celebrating all of you being a part of it and doing your work because I think it's just, you know, if all of us, all of us who's listening, all of the people are listening to us and also leaders and, and are big on uh, changing the system. So I think this is what I would encourage everybody to do. Think bigger, think that you can, your voice matters, do what you can. It starts with your own life. It starts how you perceive yourself. It start, it's as easy as to ask yourself about your appearance and buying or not buying into the standards or expectations it continues into asking you know what my health means and how can I can redefine myself it starts with questioning your job and what you do and really uh, making your passion and your desires a priority and, it, and from there our kids are learning from us they are just they, because they you know, kids are so, which is like the next generation, they are learning not from what we say, but from what we are, right? So we are the ones that are creating it right now. And I want to celebrate everybody who is um, concerned and who cares, because I think we, we need to care. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Lyra. Thank you, Lyra. Thank you so much. Thank you.